Okay, this is a man named William Potter Gale. Uh, the man on the left there. He, he was a self-styled preacher who held a very long grudge. By which I mean he held a grudge that started half a century before he was born. William Potter Gale's beef with the universe began in the late 1860s, right after the Civil War. Uh, in the years after the Civil War, the, the southern states were still far from folded back into the Union. They were still under the control of federal troops. The southern states were legally part of the Union again, but only because they had lost the war. And so they were also kind of occupied territories, and they hated it. And after years of the Reconstruction era of the southern state capitals being occupied by federal troops after the Civil War, white southern lawmakers used a, a series of political machinations that would make a senator blush uh, to wrangle through Congress at the time a law to basically get those federal troops, those hated Yankee Union troops, out of the South. Quote, from and after the passage of this act, it shall not be lawful to employ any part of the Army of the United States as a posse comitatus. That, la that last part is Latin. Posse comitatus uh, means power of the county. And throughout history, going back to England, uh, it refers to the county government, specifically the county sheriff, as the supreme law of the land. Our Posse Comitatus Act uh, in 1878 said federal forces could no longer essentially supplant local authorities in the South. They could no longer supplant local authorities in handling law enforcement and the protection of the population. And that act came out of a very specific time for a very specific purpose. That act said, Union troops, get out of the South. Our counties are going to take it from here. And so, roughly a dozen years after the end of the Civil War, the federal government did pull the troops back from the Southern states. And local white officials in the South were thereby essentially cleared to reassert their authority over their own communities. And we know exactly what they decided to do with it, right? The end of the Reconstruction era led to Jim Crow segregation and the lynchings and the cross burnings and the organized terror campaigns against black Americans that were used to enforce the Jim Crow rules. The years after Reconstruction were so difficult for our country that a lot of people still argue that the Civil War hadn't really ended in the South. And it went on that way, decade after decade, out of the 19th century and into the 20th century. In 1957, President Eisenhower sent federal troops back into the American South. He sent them so they could stand guard over the integration of Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. He sent soldiers to make that happen. The U.S. Supreme Court had made integration the law of the land, but it took federal troops to make it the law of Arkansas. By that time, uh, old William Potter Gale, he was already preaching anti-federal government, white supremacist claptrap, uh, which he put under the banner of the Christian Identity Movement. Uh, but that decision by President Eisenhower to send in those troops to Arkansas in 1957, that so enraged William Potter Gale that he decided that he was going to start his own new branch of that movement and he was going to give it a new name. A uh, writer named Kevin Carey wrote a terrific account of this uh, a while back in the Washington Monthly. William Potter Gale called his new movement Posse Comitatus. He named it after that 1878 law that had forced Union troops out of the Reconstruction South. As Mr. Gale explained his idea, quote, County sheriffs were the supreme legal law enforcement officers in the land, and county residents had the right to form a posse to enforce the Constitution However, they, as sovereign citizens, chose to interpret it. Public officials who interfered, said Gale, should be hung by the neck at noon. So, so individuals are sovereign. Only the county sheriff is in charge. The federal government has no authority in this guy's white supremacist world. And, and yes, his operating theory sounds crazy and fringe, and it was crazy and fringe. But if that was your particular flavor of extremism in, say, the early 1970s, and you didn't think the anti-civil rights, anti-fluoride John Birch Society was extreme enough for you, then you could join William Potter Gale and his radical posse comitatus. All through the 1970s, Mr. Gale worked the Farm Belt states specifically, uh, planning chapters and clusters in places like Kansas uh, and Texas. His Texas chapter was founded by this guy, um, who's named Gordon Call. Before the Posse Comitatus thing ever got going, really, Gordon Call had already announced that he would no longer pay income taxes because he said he was sovereign as a man. He said the government was Satan. 
And for a long time, it was one thing to be that one lone guy in Texas with that crazy idea. But along comes this good organizer guy with the posse comitatus idea, idea. And all of a sudden, he's a leading member of a movement. This, you know, the sheriff is the only law way out there, racist Christian identity movement called the Posse Comitatus. Gordon Cole, the guy from Texas, he ended up serving time in prison uh, for not paying his taxes because he didn't believe he had to. Um, then he got out on parole and he violated his parole. And once he violated his parole, federal marshals came to collect him and it went horribly wrong. Police in the Northern Plains and Canada tonight are hunting for at least two gunmen wanted for killing two U.S. Marshals in a blazing shootout last night. It happened in Medina, North Dakota, and as Roger O'Neill reports, the men who got away are members of Posse Comitatus, a militant anti-tax group. Police were trying to arrest 53-year-old Gordon Call of Midland, Texas, for violating probation on an income tax evasion conviction. Call is described as a fanatical opponent of taxes. He was formerly a farmer in North Dakota and was attending an anti-tax meeting of farmers at this clinic in Medina. Call, a member of the radical anti-tax group Posse Comitatus, is known to be armed and dangerous. Authorities say in the past, Call has said he would not be taken alive. Gordon Call ended up uh, escaping to Arkansas and he was killed in a shootout in Arkansas. That was 1983. A little less than a decade later, in 1992, it was a white supremacist in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. He'd sold some sawed-off shotguns to somebody who turned out to be an undercover ATF agent. Uh, he ended up going to jail, getting released on bail, not turning up for his trial when federal marshals turned up at his place to say, hey, you got to turn up for your trial. He ended up in a shootout with those federal marshals. His wife and his teenage son and a marshal were all killed. That was Ruby Ridge. Randy Weaver was a member of the Aryan Nations. He'd also bounced around this world of tax protesters and people who considered themselves to be sovereign citizens, direct inheritors of this idea that you are a nation unto yourself, you are sovereign, and no one can tell you what to do except for maybe the sheriff. Today, the people who call themselves sovereign citizens are definitely still around. Their numbers are increasing, according to the people who track these things. Uh, one of the most visible signs about them is that they tend to make their own IDs if they carry them at all. They may not put real license plates on their cars as well, because to them, there is no legitimate state or federal government. And it's silly stuff in a way, but over time, these self-proclaimed sovereign citizens have become pretty violent and therefore pretty scary. In 1993, a farmer named James Nichols contested a speeding ticket in Michigan by claiming that he was a sovereign citizen and thus could not be prosecuted. His brother tried to pull the same thing by paying a debt on a bank that, a, that, uh, of a, that he that, and a bank that he, was an institution that he made up and did not exist. His brother was Terry Nichols. Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols uh, both consider themselves to be sovereign citizens. They ended up blowing up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995, killing more than 150 people. When Timothy McVeigh got pulled over after the Oklahoma City bombing, it was because he was driving a car without license plates because sovereign citizens don't believe in license plates. Over the years, the members of these groups, spawned by the Posse Comitatus movement, they've tried to separate themselves sometimes from the overt racism and white supremacy that launched their movement in the first place. Uh, but after a lot of new attention to these groups, after the bombing in Oklahoma City, NBC's Nightly News uh, did a segment where they sent a hidden camera into a Missoula gun show. And the reporter for that segment, Fred Francis, he found all those old threads uh, still knotted together. In many cases, the hate groups of the past have reconstituted themselves into these militias. In isolated regions like this, it's easy to find people who worry about losing their weapons. But once involved, many find there is an ideology driving the militia craze. White supremacy. With the Christian the identity the movement armory. deep in the background. Nearby, a branch of his militia was selling guerrilla manuals along with blatantly anti-black, anti-Semitic literature. This comic book, aimed at school kids, features the hero White Will and contains graphic images of whites beating blacks. And this book, America, Free, White, and Christian, saying that the United States was created as a white and Christian nation, that freedom of religion basically pertained only to Christians. And with these weapons confiscated from Michigan militiamen last year was this religious tract, warning, revelation is about to be fulfilled. It forecasts death for anyone who's not a Christian true believer. 
That report from NBC was in 1995, a quarter century after the pseudo-minister with the grudge launched this whole idea of the white Christian birthright, Christian identity, the white Christian birthright in a world in which there is no real federal American government and the county sheriff is the only law of the land that a sovereign citizen man should acknowledge. Uh, today, you can still find him, William Potter Gale. You can still find him in places like this, memorialized by the Aryan nations online. But you can also find echoes of his ideas uh, in places like this, uh, the Oath Keepers, Guardian, Guardians of the Republic, uh, and the Ten Orders That They Will Not Obey. Uh, also, these folks, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, led by Sheffer, uh, Sheriff Richard Mack, foremost purveyor of the Sheriffs in Charge rule today, sponsored by what I'm sure is some very nice freeze-dried apocalyptic food. Sheriff Mack was uh, the one who made headlines in the middle of the Cliven Bundy Fox News hyped Nevada Ranch standoff recently when he said that he and the militia members flocking to Nevada to fight the federal government alongside that rancher, they might try to use their wives and daughters as human shields once the shooting started. We were actually strategizing to put all the women up at the front. If they're going to start shooting, it's going to be women that are going to be televised all across the world getting shot by these rogue federal officers. You see what it says on his hat there? See? C-S-P-O-A. That's his group, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. You go to their website, it tells you about power-hungry government officials backed by people with hidden agendas have convinced us to sacrifice our freedoms bit by bit. And with every change, they gain a little more power, a little more control. But what does this have to do with us, the, uh, the, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association? Well, this. The county sheriff, he says, is the line in the sand. The county sheriff is the one who can say to the feds, beyond these bounds you shall not pass. This is not only within the scope of the sheriff's authority, it is the sheriff's sworn duty. Explain, we already have hundreds of police, sheriffs, and other officials who have expressed a desire to be part of this holy cause of liberty. We're going to train and vet them all state by state. Then these local governments will issue our new declaration to the federal government regarding the abuses that we will no longer tolerate or accept. Said declaration will be enforced by our constitutional sheriffs and peace officers. In short, the CSPOA will be an army to set our nation free. An army that will free us from the federal government because the county sheriff is the highest law in the land. There is no federal government. There's only the sheriff. Posse comitatus, the power of the county. This idea that the county sheriff is the highest law in the land and the federal government has no authority, it is a weird idea. But it is an old idea that is directly, in a linear way, directly descendant in this country from the people who came up with this cockamamie argument in the first place in the 1800s to argue that federal troops shouldn't be allowed into the South to protect black people. When you hear people arguing this weird idea that they don't acknowledge the authority of the federal government, that they only acknowledge the sheriff, there is a really specific place where that idea comes from. What is your response to Harry Reid? I don't have a response for Harry Reid, but I have a response for every sheriff across the United States. Every county sheriff across the United States disarm the federal uh, bureaucrats. Take the federal, federal United States bureaucrats' guns away. That's my message today. They wanted to show the American people and the world that they had unlimited power and they, you know, they had taken over state sovereignty, our, our Nevada laws, our public lands. All right. You know, listen, yeah. listen, do you think they really have taken it over? I don't think so. They might have took over our uh, Clark County Sheriff, but they never took over we the people, the sovereign people of this nation. We, we're standing. And we're going to we're going to stand until we take the guns away from those bureaucracies. What would happen if they came in the early morning hours one day to your ranch? Well, first they got to say, Harry, get your army out of Nevada. Get your army away from my ranch and off the Clark County public land and keep it out. And if they come, we'll deal with them tonight. If that's what we got to do, we'll just deal with you. Just when you got guts enough to do it, come on. Well, he also said, Richard Mack, is I don't think it would be possible to launch a raid without violence. If they came to arrest you, would you surrender? 
I went to the proper uh, authorities. Meaning? And I don't believe, I don't believe, uh, there would have to be Clark County Sheriff. If he come to arrest me, I would definitely uh, let him arrest me. All right, let me go. He's the only man in. Go ahead. He's the only man with resting power in Clark County, Nevada. Clark County Sheriff is the highest legal authority in the country. If you live in Clark County, Nevada. Fox News Channel, uh, the conservative media broadly. I don't think there's any reason to believe that they have spent all this time hyping and glorifying and romanticizing this rancher in Nevada because he is a posse comitatus guy because he adheres to this long-standing, bizarre, conspiratorial American fringe belief that the sheriff is the highest legal authority in the country and the federal government doesn't exist. I don't think Fox News has been celebrating him for weeks now specifically because of that. But somebody should have noticed that the guy kept bringing this stuff up, right? I don't recognize the United States government as, as, as even existing. Even in the really far right wing reaches that have become normal Republican and conservative politics in our country in the last few years, it is not a typical thing to hear somebody say, not that they don't like the federal government or that they wish the federal government was smaller, but that they don't believe the federal government exists. That's weird, right? I mean, when you're talking with somebody about the actions of this purported federal government and they respond that they don't think it exists, that they recognize no legal authority other than their county sheriff, that is a weird enough assertion that it should prick up your ears, right? It should make you Google or something, shouldn't it? There would have to be Clark County Sheriff. If he come to arrest me, I would definitely uh, let him arrest me. All right, let me go. He's the only man in... Go ahead. He's the only man with resting power in Clark County, Nevada. Okay, let's move on. That, that was one of more than a half a dozen appearances that this sovereign citizen Nevada sheriff uh, has made on the Fox News channel in the past couple of weeks. They keep booking him over and over and over and over and over again, doing segment after segment all day long and all over their primetime lineup, lionizing this guy, taking on his fight against the federal government as if it is their own, celebrating when all the media coverage that they themselves gave him caused enough men with guns to turn up and point their guns at federal officials that the federal officials left the scene without enforcing the legal federal court order that they had to enforce. And all the time they kept booking him and putting him on TV and putting him on talk radio. All the time they kept interviewing him. He kept insisting, bringing up on his own terms, he kept insisting on how the federal government doesn't really exist. He doesn't recognize the authority of the federal government. He doesn't open mail from the federal government. He doesn't think the United States government is a thing. And he keeps advancing this bizarre theory that only county sheriffs have authority in America. And the conservative media booking him and the Republican politicians siding with him, they all just ignore the fact that he is spouting weird, sovereign citizen, posse comitatus, conspiracy theory nonsense every time they give him a microphone. And it's nonsense of a very specific origin. It's nonsense that derives from the theory that the 14th Amendment destroyed the last real American government and federal authority shouldn't be allowed into the South to protect black people from racist whites. And that fringe and very specific American sickness has been preserved and handed down in the centuries since they invented it in Reconstruction. It has been preserved and handed down in the centuries since by white supremacists, to the point where you can buy sovereign citizens, I don't recognize the federal government, fake legal papers to try to use in court. You can buy those fake legal papers out of the back pages of Aryan Brotherhood newsletters that circulate in the prison system. Whoever was asleep at the switch at the Fox News Channel and in the offices of Senator Rand Paul and Senator Dean Heller and all of these other people who embraced this Nevada guy and who never noticed all the omnipotent sheriff stuff he kept saying. And so they were shocked, shocked when he came to this for the people who were asleep at the switch. Why were you? Why didn't you see this coming? I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. They didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for the young girls to do. And because they were basically on government subsidy, and so now what do they do? They abort their, their young children. They put their young men in jail because they never, they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? 
That was set on Saturday. Uh, the remarks were first reported last night by the New York Times. Uh, the rancher first asked that the Times retract its story, uh, but then Media Matters got its hand on the tape of him actually saying it. Turns out the Times quote was spot on. Today, uh, the rancher reiterated his remarks on a couple more radio shows explaining the same thing about how blacks were better off in slavery, or at least we ought to ask about it. Back again tonight at his ranch, he said it again with a lot of press there. And the conservative media and the Republican politicians who have glorified him and, and tried to turn him into a national hero, today they say they are shocked, shocked that it turns out he thinks African Americans should be picking cotton as slaves because that would at least be good for them. And let us all pray that it is out of ignorance that the National Review comparing him to Gandhi and the right-wing activists comparing him to Rosa Parks and the Fox News Channel booking him and his family and over and over and over and over and over again as heroes and the Republican senator calling his armed supporters pointing guns at federal law enforcement officers patriots. Let us pray that that was happening under a veil of ignorance. Let us pray that they had no idea that there is a long-standing, fairly violent right-wing movement in this country that is born in the defense of slavery and that causes people to say weird stuff about sheriffs being the supreme authority and the federal government not existing. Let us pray that the right and these Republican senators made a hero out of this guy in bloody ignorance of where he was really coming from. But it is a choice as to whether or not you do your homework before you try to mainstream a guy like this. The, the turn today to let me tell you another thing I know about the Negro, that was telegraphed way, way, way in advance here. Anybody who chose not to see it coming now has this mess all over themselves.